test scores were below par, and I failed to get into graduate school. As a result, I went west uh, to a trade school and learned the art of gunsmithing. And I've employed myself as a custom gunsmith and gun designer over the last 30 years. Uh, I met my wife, Debbie, uh, who's in the back of the room, at uh, Cold Firearms, where we both worked in the product engineering department. And in 1982, we returned to New Hampshire, and I uh, still had it in my mind that I wanted to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. Uh, can we hit the lights for this uh, front part, Matt? Uh, and I had a leg up on this because my father, Lawrence Killam, uh, was a virologist at the Dartmouth Medical School, studied birds as an advocate. Uh, so I grew up in a household with lots of wild animals around. Uh, when I was two, my dad went on sabbatical to Africa and brought a half-grown leopard into the house, much to my mother's chagrin. My younger sister, Phoebe, who helps me with the bears today, was one at the time, and my next oldest brother, Josh, was four. He woke up one night with a leopard at the end of his bed, uh, screaming, but needless to say, we all survived, and, and we returned from Africa with two African hornbills and a Nile crocodile that my dad raised in a basement shower until it was six feet long, and the National Zoo had to come and pick it up. In 1961, uh, we moved to New Hampshire, and my dad got the job at the Dartmouth Medical School. And uh, I was nine at the time, and he had licenses to keep all native wildlife because he, of his bird research. So we had woodpeckers and aviaries, uh, crows and ravens. My dad had written a book on had written a book on the life histories of the woodpeckers of the eastern United States, as well as a book on crows and ravens. We had woodchucks and fox and porcupines and beaver, and just about every animal imaginable. It was a time before formal wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, so uh, we grew up with, with quite a menagerie around, as well as uh, domestic uh, animals like sheep and goats and things like that. Uh, when my time came along, I was interested in carnivores. And uh, carnivores present a bit of a problem to study uh, Unlike birds, my dad tried it himself on simple apparatus. He had a pair of binoculars and a small folding chair, and he and my mother would sit in front of woodpecker nests and document courtship and behavior. And, uh, but carnivores, if you've been in the woods and you get a glimpse of them, you know they disappear rapidly into the, into the dense foliage. And I had to figure out a way uh, that I could get access to them, uh, enough so I could document their behavior. And based on my childhood experience, I realized that I could raise a carnivore loose in the forest, acting as a surrogate mother to it, and document its juvenile behavior and use that to understand its adult behavior. Now, I wasn't thinking about black bears, because at the time I started this, black, there was no formal rehabilitation of black bears in either Vermont or New Hampshire. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of a bobcat or a coyote or perhaps a fish with a large woodland weasel we have around here. Uh, my sister Phoebe and I became licensed wildlife rehabilitators. Uh, Phoebe was interested in husbandry. I was interested in studying behavior. Uh, but at the end of two years, none of those animals came our way. But one day, a conservation officer brought us an 11-month-old black bear cub, uh, breaking departmental policy he thought it had been hit by an automobile. We had our veterinarians look at it, and uh, they determined that it had not been hit by an automobile. It had no infectious disease, yet it was still wobbly. It had the shakes, and it couldn't climb or stay on a branch. Uh, and I was interested in finding out what the ailment was. Simply uh, euthanizing the animal and tossing away wasn't an answer for me. Uh, but the bear was quickly confiscated us because we lacked a permit. Uh, later that spring, I got a call from the director of Fish and Game in New Hampshire, and he asked me if I'd take the bear back. And uh, uh, we kept it until ultimately it couldn't fend for itself, and we euthanized it and sent it spraying out to the Wildlife Disease Lab in Wyoming, and got a diagnosis of lysosomal storage disease. Uh -huh. And uh, lysosomal storage disease, uh, the human equivalent is Tay-Sachs, which is caused by inbreeding. And this is the first documented case of lysosomal storage disease in black bears. It's very rare in wild uh, animal populations. 
relatively common in domestic animal populations because after all that's how we get our domestic animals. And uh, since that time, there have been two more cases in New Hampshire. Uh, there's two in Massachusetts, one in Maine, and more recently one out in Wyoming. The likely cause of this disease is the fact that in the 1850s, uh, most of New England, 85% of New England, was open agricultural land. The forests uh, were fragmented and reduced to very small, continuous areas. And on top of that, there was 125 years of counting of black bears. So their populations were reduced to island populations where this type of injury might have occurred. Potentially, it's a serious problem uh, for the black bear population because uh, for every cub that's born with the disease, there's one born without it and two uh, that are carriers. And whenever two carriers mate, uh, this disease pops up again. And uh, we don't know how frequently uh, that, it, that it's popping up. Most of these cubs don't survive. Later that spring, I got a call from Forrest Hammond from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and he heard about what I was interested in doing. He had two orphan cubs from the Stratton Mountain Bear Study in Stratton, Vermont, and he interviewed me and asked me if I would take the two cubs, and I said, well, there's a small issue of a permit, and I said, if uh, you're willing to contact New Hampshire and they're willing to give me a permit, I'll be happy to take the cubs. Well, the next morning we had a permit in hand, and <laughs> since that time we have raised, rehabilitated, and returned to the wild over 105 black bear cubs. Wow. Uh, two years ago, we had an extraordinary number of black bears. <laughs> we ended up with 30, uh, and that was the result of 2011 being an extraordinarily good food year, followed by 2012, which was a horrible food year. Many of you uh, may remember that we had two weeks of, of 70 and 80, 80 degree temperatures in March uh, that disrupted uh, not only the apple crop, but the berry crop. So there were a lot of hungry female bears uh, with cubs looking for, for food. Over half of these cubs came to us because their mothers were shot at unprotected chicken coops or beehives. By unprotected, I mean a simple electric fence with bait on it to keep bears out of anything. And anybody who's raising backyard chickens anywhere in New England, because all of New England is bear country, uh, should protect your livestock. And certainly shouldn't go out and just shoot any animal that uh, gets in the way. This year, uh, last year we had a single cub, and this year we're already at 16 cubs. Uh, things seem to be changing. The first cubs came to us in, uh, on February 13th, the earliest we've ever had them. Uh, two of these were the result of the logging operation, and the other two was uh, somebody shot a mother bear, a rabbit hunter shot a mother bear in the den, and then let his dog get after the cubs. So one of the cubs died from being crushed uh, by the dog, and the other the other cub had bad injuries but had survived and was doing well. Uh, my interest in the bears is studying behavior. Uh, I've, I've always been fascinated, you know, fascinated by how things work. Uh, you won't be able to read this chart, uh, but when I started doing this work, bears were considered to be solitary animals. That is, the only interactions they had to their own kind, was with their offspring and their mates during the mating season. They knew they congregated at concentrated food sources, but beyond that they didn't know very much about them. And uh, you can see from this, this chart, uh, this is my representation of the social behavior of bears, that it's very complex. Uh, what I've found is that the bears are social, but they're not social like the typical animal we think of chimpanzee or a wolf that has a territory, a family unit living within that territory, uh, and, a, and a hierarchy, a hard hierarchy with alpha animals that allocate the resources down through the family group. The closest thing the bears have to a formal territory is a female home range. And uh, an adult female needs three to five square miles of high quality land, land to raise cubs on. And that's primarily because their cubs have short legs. Uh, they can't travel very far when the cubs are, are, are first uh, mobile. 
And uh, these female home ranges are, are evenly distributed across the landscape in a cookie cutter fashion. But the food that the bears eat is the highest quality food in the forest. The nuts, berries, and ants, bees, and grubs. And these foods are generally available in stands. Uh, they're affected by the weather, and they're unevenly dispersed on the landscape. So at any given time, one female bear may have a huge surplus of food in her home range, and her immediate neighbor could have nothing. And this has led to a system of sharing over time that I believe parallels early human behavior. They appear to be reciprocal altruists. They, they, they on a routine basis, cooperate and communicate uh, with strangers. And it's made, made them an extremely interesting animal to study. The cubs that I used in the, uh, for my work were the very young cubs that came to me before they had any experience with their mothers outside the den. These were the bottle feeders. These were cubs that were dependent on me regardless of how I took care of them. I decided they needed an education and I would walk them loose in the forest, acting as a surrogate mother for up to nine hours at a time and re return them safely to a remote enclosure. I was able to experience the very first time the cubs came out in an exaggerated fashion and stuck to scent and lifted that scent off an object, brought it back to a small bump behind their incisors. This bump is called the papilla of the vomeronasal system. Bears, like your dogs and cats at home, have two olfactory systems, the vomeronasal system that goes to the accessory olfactory lobe of the brain, and the nasal epithelium that goes to the olfactory lobe of the brain. The vomeronasal system identifies new scent, and the nasal epithelium uh, learns from the vomeronasal system and is, is able, later able to identify and locate scent. Uh, so I was able to see uh, the behavior associated with, with olfaction or smell, uh, something that other scientists didn't think was possible because smell, after all, is invisible. The same behavior in adult animals is still there, but it's so subtle that it's almost impossible uh, to observe. Several of these bears I followed into adulthood. Uh, this is a, uh, one of them was a bear named Yoda. Uh, Yoda lived until she was five and a half years old and raised one set of cubs. Uh, this, this is my main bear that I've worked with now, uh, Squirty. I've written her, uh, about her in both of my books, and she's been in all the films and documentaries done on me by National Geographic and the Discovery. Squirty is now 18 years old and raising her ninth set of cubs in her life. Squirty came to me as a three-pound orphan, uh, seven weeks old, and uh, not only has she been successful in establishing her own home range, Every time she uh, had a daughter and expanded her home range, she would drop a daughter in that expanded area to hold that expansion. She currently shares a greater home range with daughters and granddaughters, uh, and, and she controls it in what I call a major linear hierarchy. And uh, this is Squirty, uh, the matriarch. And her old, currently her oldest daughter, SQ2, an adult granddaughter, SNLO, a younger daughter, Brooke, another adult granddaughter, Two, and the youngest sub-adult, SQ2LO, who's the daughter of SQ2. It's a major linear hierarchy because Squirty on site will chase all the bears below her in the hierarchy. And SQ2 will chase all the bears below her SNRO will chase everybody below her, and everybody chases SNRO. <laughs> <laughs> the result of this hierarchy is that in a marginal food year, Squirty will have access to the highest quality foods in the greater home range, and it ensures that at least one of these females will be able to reproduce even if there's only a marginal amount of food. In a good food year, all the females that are capable of re reproducing that year will. Uh, the second thing that it does is the sub-adults uh, who don't have home ranges of their own can stay in this greater home range, uh, but because they're chased all the time, uh, they won't have cubs until they're much older than they would be if they had an open home range to move into. If they had an open home range, they would have their first cub at age three, 
Uh, but uh, this SQ2LO didn't have a first cup until age five. I've seen it go to age six and even age seven. Uh, so the bears are, are able to manage their populations based on a natural food source. The young males who came into the study area were quickly chased out. Uh, in this series of photos, Squirty's going after her grandson. Uh, I watched this little guy get chased more than 30 times, not only by his grandmother, but by his mother and by his aunts and any other bear that could lock a target on him. And finally, by September of his second year, he left the greater home range to join the population of male bears in the upper valley. Mm -hmm. The large males that came into the uh, Squirty's home range came there during the mating season. These large males were the 300 pound plus animals that do all the mating. They're only 10% of the population. Uh, but once the mating was done, they would hang around and take food from the females and their cubs. Uh, because of their size, they could take food from whoever they wanted to. But the females didn't tolerate this very long. And in this, this series of photos, Squirty, uh, weighing about 185 pounds, is going after a 350-pound male and asking him to leave. I watched her daughter, SQ2, and she weighed only 135 pounds to a very stiff, exaggerated walk in front of a large 350-pound male. And he acted like it was no big deal. He backed off into the bushes. But in the morning, he was gone, and he never returned. And this suggests that there's a degree of female choice in mating. Otherwise, these large males would, if there wasn't a, a repercussion, these large males would stay and compete with the females and their cubs and the female whole range. The really big surprise in my study was that my study area is, is in the center of Squirty's home range. And I go up there, it's on my own property. I, we have 400 acres. It's about a mile off the nearest dirt road. Uh, it, I, I've been uh, uh, keeping track of uh, social interactions. I'm, I'm currently a, a PhD candidate at Drexel University, and I've observed uh, more than a thousand social interactions between bears and documented them. Uh, I go up in the evening uh, at the same time, and I provide a small food reward to any bear that shows up while I'm there. Uh, and the bears can tell time. Uh, some nights there's no bears, and some nights uh, there's quite a few bears. And uh, uh, this bear, uh, these unrelated females, uh, would come in and share Squirty's uh, surplus resources, and she'd show no aggression towards them whatsoever. Uh, she let them come in and take her food, and, and there was no chasing, no running after them. And uh, they were all relatives of this bear, a bear we call Moose. Uh, Moose is 13 years Squirty's senior. And uh, all of the rest of the females that came in were, were part of her clan. They were her daughters and granddaughters. And Squirty controlled an oak ridge, and Moose and her clan controlled a 23,000 acre area of beach to the east of Squirty's oak ridge. So in years when there weren't any acorns, Squirty and her clan would go over into Moose's area to feed on beach. And in years when there were, uh, was no beach, uh, Moose and her clan would come onto Squirty's Ridge to feed on acorns. Uh, so there was reciprocity in this relationship. Uh, there were social contracts and cost counting. And uh, this was something that I realized was another parallel to human behavior. We think about it, uh, we're much harsher on our family members than we are on strangers. And we're harsh on our family members because our family members are our closest cooperators. And we have to communicate with them. And unfortunately, it's not always pretty. And, it's, and because it's not always pretty, uh, we can get away with it because we can reconcile with our family members. Uh, but you never go up to a stranger and accost a stranger the way you might a family member because that stranger is also a cooperator. And you might not be able to reconcile with a stranger. He might be important at some time in your future. So this, this, this same parallel takes place uh, with the black bear. 
I wondered about male bears, uh, what was special about them, uh, what I found out about females was pretty remarkable. Uh, but male bears are a lot more difficult to study than female bears. Uh, the average male bear can have a ho annual home range of up to 200 square miles. Uh, initially, I put uh, telemetry collars on a male bear, and, and he disappeared over a mountain. I got my automobile and drove around looking for him, and then ultimately I got in an airplane uh, flying around looking for him, and I spent an awful lot of time and learned very little about his behavior. <laughs> and finally, uh, when trail cameras came down in price, I decided to monitor the surplus bears or the extra bears in the female home ranges using trail cameras. And I would go to areas where there was an extraordinary amount of bear sign, usually in a, a timber cut uh, or a clear cut, and I would set up my monitoring cameras uh, with a gallon bag of corn in front of the camera. And it was not unusual to get pictures of eight or ten different male bears in a two-week period. And I literally took 75 to 100,000 pictures before things fell into place and started to make sense. But in 2008, I had the perfect situation. I was set up in a clear cut that was 16 years old, right at the end of its productivity. I got my eight or 10 different males. And in 2009, when I set my cameras up in the same place, the only bear there was the resident female. The males had all moved on uh, to find another area of surplus food. And in 2008, I had an awful lot of pictures of two male bears sharing that small amount of corn. And these two male bears were unrelated. Uh, I've done the DNA of uh, pedigree of all the bears in my study area. We collect hair samples with, with hair snares and wherever we have an opportunity uh, to, to, to collect samples. And we have the, tested at the UNH genome, genome lab. And we found that the male bear population was genetically unrelated to each other. Uh, so these bears, their strategy to access surplus food in the female home ranges was to form a loose group of friends, and uh, 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 friends who were strangers. And the only other uh, mammal that, that forms groups or coalitions of strangers are humans. Uh, this has not been do documented in any, any other non-human All of this is about the access to food, and in the spring of the year, the bears eat what I call emerging growth. Um, they eat the uh, plants uh, before they harden off while the nutrients are still available. These cubs are climbing a red oak tree and eating uh, oak leaf starts as the buds first break in the leaves. Uh, when they emerge from the dens in early April, they'll be eating uh, sw the swollen buds of the beach, and then the beach leaf starts, and then beech leaves as late as the, uh, the middle of June. They'll eat nodding sedge in the woodland trails, the flowers of white ash and red maple. Uh, and in this early spring, if, if you drive around in the morning and evening, you can see bears at the edge of agricultural fields uh, feeding on succulent grass. Uh, they have, there's a wide amount of food that's available to them in the spring. None of it's going to make them fat, but it is going to sustain them. And uh, because of this, and, and the, the important thing about the spring foods is that it's evenly distributed across the landscape. So the bears can go anywhere and get a meal, and there's very little social aggression involved with access to food. And because of this, the bears pick the spring of the year for their mating season. Uh, the, the female bears come in, first come into estrus in the last week of May, and continue until the first week of July, that coincides with the berry season. Uh, the male and female bears spend uh, three to seven days together, and the result of that union is a two-celled organism called the blastocyst. They're delayed implanters, so the blastocyst doesn't implant into the uterus until late November, early December. Then there's a short gestation period of 50 to 55 days. The cubs are born in the dead of winter in mid-January. The cubs are born weighing less than a pound, their eyes are shut, their little ear flaps are down, and they continue to develop outside the womb in the winter den uh, in their mother's fur. Uh, and they're not able to, 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 to walk or, or travel until she emerges from the den in early to mid-April. 
And the first thing the mother bear does is to build a nest at the bottom of a good climbing tree. The cubs instinctively can climb, but they have to learn about rough bark, smooth bark, and the skinny end of a limb. Uh, they, they will spend up to three to four weeks at this site uh, getting good at climbing and, 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 and walking so they can travel with their mother. Uh, she'll move on uh, to better feeding sites and she'll go from one large pine tree or hemlock tree, trees we call babysitting trees. Uh, when they're in the babysitting trees, they'll be up there still practicing climbing. The mother bear will radiate out from the bottom of the tree to, to feed. Uh, the cub's toenails are audible on the bark, so if something scares the cubs, the mother can return in a hurry to see what's going on. They'll continue to feed and forage in this fashion throughout the summer and, and fall, and as yearlings, they'll den with the mother in the winter den, and the family unit will break up the following June when the male bear shows up again. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was fortunate to see both the pre-courtship and courtship behavior of the black bear, and I have a video uh, here of Squirty's daughter, SQ2, when she first encounters a large male. You'll see that she's kind of upset by the whole thing, and a little aggressive, and uh, he's quite calm and collected. <laughs> she's been with her cubs for 18 months, and this big stranger shows up, and he's been out Don wanting around for uh, <laughs> the rest of the season. Uh, you'll see him open and closing his mouth. Uh, he's excelling, expelling moist air from his lungs and picking up her condition of estrus and drawing it back to his olfactory senses. catches up with her and, and grabs her with his forepaws and he'll bite her behind the neck. All of this aggression and the bite behind the neck uh, stimulate the female as it helps her ovulate precisely at the time the mating takes place, which ensures conception. Uh, this first uh, coupling only lasted a few minutes and then they went into a, a ritualized uh, open mouth wrestling around the clearing for another 20 minutes. I have the center part of my book has a lot of pictures of that open mouth wrestling. Uh, and finally he got a hold of her a second time, and then this time they locked up, uh, they literally hooked up. Uh, the male there has a baculum or penis bone that's like a dog that locks over the female pelvis. They were locked together for over 45 minutes. And during that time, there was another female bear in the clearing who walked by and 10 feet away, rubbernecking as the woman. Finally, they broke up and, and disappeared into the forest. 85% of the black bears diet is vegetative matter. And the remaining uh, portion of their diet, the remaining 10 to 15%, is animal protein. And of that animal protein, 90 to 95% is ants, bees, and grubs. Now having said that, bears are, are opportunists, and uh, they will take a deer fawn or a moose calf in the first week of life. Uh, they'll take a bird's nest or a fledgling bird off a branch if they run across one. Uh, but they're not true predators. They don't respond, respond to sound or movement in the woods. And uh, I used to tell audiences that bears ate ants, 10 or 15 times a day, but one afternoon I was out with Squirty and she'd run her nose along a log, smell a colony of ants, bite into the log, uh, lick up whatever larvae and, and ants that got in the way and move on to the next colony. She was locating and cleaning out colonies of ants at the rate of 40 to 60 an hour. Wow. Yoda, uh, one fall, made it was a dry fall along the Mascoma River, uh, she made her fall feeding strategy going after ground nesting hornets or yellow jackets. Uh, and she would smell a, a yellow jacket nest from about 35 yards off. She 
can hone in on the scent, bite into the nest, about 150 hornets with whacker in the face, you can shake them off and then fat or muzzle and go right in and clean out whatever larvae and hornets that they got in the way. Uh, and and then, then she'd walk off casually with a swarm of hornets over her head, kind of like a pig pen and a peanut scar. <laughs> in the meantime, her cubs would hit the deck and cover all their vitals so they couldn't take uh, the stains anywhere near as well as she could. The summer vegetative foods of the black bear uh, all grow in moist, rich soils. Uh, they have three uh, primary plant groups, uh, jewelweed or touch-me-not that grows in everybody's yard in the spring, uh, three species of wild lettuce, and the most important is jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit is the most important because it has a root or a corn uh, that they eat from the size of a dime to the size of a baseball. And uh, these uh, roots are more nutritious than either beech nuts or acorns, and uh, it's their primary root crop in New Hampshire. In years when the nut uh, crop fails, they'll rely heavily on jack and pulpit uh, to sustain them and get them through the year. It's the summer vegetative foods that bring uh, people and bears close together, because after all, uh, we settled we settled in the valleys uh, for those moist, rich soils because they were more fertile. And uh, uh, it's not unusual in New Hampshire for somebody to have a nicely mowed lawn that leads up to an old orchard with maybe three feet of vegetation. A black bear could be out there feeding on Jack in the pulpit, and you'd never know it. You'd never know it unless you went out there and saw the stoppled trails and the occasional divot for the white roots coming into it, uh, where a bear dug a Jack in the pulpit root. You'd never know it unless the bear stuck its head up in the air and smelled black oil sunflowers. <laughs> black oil sunflower seed has three times the calories per unit of any of their natural food. And bears prioritize their food by the quality of food, the quantity of food, and the amount of risk that it takes to get to food. In my experience, black oil sunflower seed is served up at between 5 and 25 pounds at a time. And uh, a bear can come into your yard and get a day's pay in about 15 minutes. Uh, the average black bear needs to put on 30% of its body weight in fat get through the winter and the hybrid. A female black bear that's going to give birth to cubs needs to put on 50% uh, uh, of her body weight in fat uh, to give birth to cubs to nurse them through the winter and to have some reserves for the early spring. So if you want to understand why bears act the way they do around food, just think how we act around money. After all, we store our money for a rainy day. We would put our money in our bank for our retirement, to put our kids through school, or to buy a fancy toy. And you wouldn't go home tonight and leave $20 bills all over your lawn and expect that nobody would come pick one of them up. And that's the same thing that happens when there's food attractions around, whether it's uh, 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 garbage that's not secured uh, or birds. Uh, it's a terrible temptation for the bears. It's much higher quality food than they have available to them in nature. And in times of, of food shortages, it becomes uh, a real challenge for bears not to go into people's yard. The natural foods that the bears use uh, to, to get fat and reproduce uh, in New Hampshire are red oak acorns and beech nuts. Uh, the red oak is in the central and southern parts of the state and up the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, beech is in the balance of the state in the northeastern part. Um, Bears have a number of different types of dens in New Hampshire. Uh, in this picture, I'm crawling out of an excavated den that, that Yoda used uh, both for her maternal den and for a den with her yearlings. She dug it under an old root mass of a tree that had gone over many years ago, and there's a live tree growing out of the top of it. When I crawled into the den and looked up, the ceiling of the den was a matrix of live roots that prevented the soils from collapsing down around her and her cubs. This bear had a different strategy. Uh, she, this is what we call an open ground nest. 
Uh, this is unusual because it's in a hardwood clear cut. You know, these typically are in dense softwood regeneration, so dense that you could walk by a bear's den 10 feet away and never know what was there. Uh, they typically have structure behind them, either a down log or a tree. And sometimes these are very elaborate, like a, a huge robin's nest, three feet across, perfectly rounded in the bottom, and maybe 16 inches deep. Um, here's this bear chose the winter sun to give birth and take care of her cubs. The next type of den we see are, are rock dens. Uh, these uh, rock dens make our winter den work difficult. Uh, I have a, a cooperative project with New Hampshire Fish and Game where we keep uh, GPS collars on uh, 10 wild females and we have to change the batteries. Uh, uh, I'm interested in, in behavior. Uh, Fish and Game wants to know the number of cubs that are born every year and uh, the number that survive as yearlings uh, for the population models and estimates. Uh, the problem is that these entrances are not much bigger than a bear's head. And the bear's uh, shoulders are very supple, uh, their backs are very flexible, and they can wiggle down into the crevices uh, where we can't imagine getting them out. We often can see them, we might even be able to sedate them, uh, but sometimes we simply can't get them out of these dens. We thought about designing the perfect UNH student who was skinny and strong and flexible and we could lower down by his bootstraps and we could pull one of these bears out, but so far that hasn't worked very well. Here's a yearling bear with its mother in a rock den. And the last type of den we see are tree dens. Uh, these are in overgrown trees. Uh, when they reach about three feet in diameter, the center of the tree can decay and rot out, leaving a huge cavity in the tree. There may be only two or three inches of live wood. Uh, this particular tree was outside of a new residential uh, development in line. And one morning in April, I got a call from a woman that there was a bear in her tree. And I got there, and sure enough, there was a bear in her tree. And I informed her that the bear had been in the tree all winter long. <laughs> with this complex communicate, with this complex social behavior, you 